But uh, all, all jokes aside, I think um, I don't really want to address the the FUD and granularity. I think it's a nonsensical argument. Alex DeVries, in, in my opinion, I, I believe him to be deeply conflicted and biased. Um, but all of that aside, I, I just would like to maybe get a temperature check on, you know, where do you do you see the Bitcoin narrative as having made progress in terms of FUD? Or are we still fighting um, what's seemingly been an uphill battle as, as there seem to be, you know, opponents coming out of the woodwork? Um, where, do, where are we in that process? Oh, I think that you're going to continue. It will help when the ETF comes out, in my experience, mm -hmm. in the gold space. So when the GLD came out, um, uh, the, the regulatory world was always anti-gold mining stocks and gold mining funds. They were always suspect and everyone was bad promoters. And it was always mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a horrible comment, comment, reputation that you had to always deal with. Uh, when the GLD came, GLD came out, all of a sudden that narrative of regulatory attack in the gold mining industry sort of stopped. And um, if they're bad characters, bad characters, but as a whole blanket, uh, I think that's what's going to happen with Bitcoin. Alrighty, everyone. Welcome to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. I'm really excited for another episode today here with Frank Holmes and Aiden Killick of Hive Digital Technologies. Um, and right now we're in the midst of a little bit of a Bitcoin rip. Um, and we also have a potential spot Bitcoin ETF on the horizon. Um, but in addition, we have a fresh round of mining FUD to dismantle as we approach the 2024 halving. Um, and so I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. I think uh, as we trade around this $44,000 level, um, you know, optimism is really high, uh, but I think people are looking forward to, you know, what is next? Where is uh, what, what is the outlook as we approach the having, especially for the mining industry? Um, and I think Aiden and Frank are going to be excellent guests to help us unpack that. Um, and just a, a bit of a background there. Um, Hive Digital Technologies is a sponsor of Bitcoin Magazine. So um, for everyone watching at home, please be aware of that. And I always encourage you to do your own research um, and to not trust, but instead verify. But um, at Bitcoin Magazine, we are thankful to Hive for supporting our mission of education and encouraging Bitcoin adoption. Um, so with that out of the way, I'm pleased to welcome Frank Holmes, the co-founder and executive chairman of Hive, as well as Aiden Killick, who is the president and CEO of Hive to the show. So uh, yeah, without without further ado, uh, Aiden and Frank, welcome to the show. How are you guys doing today? Outstanding, my friend, and so is Happy Buddha. Bitcoin going up to 44,000. We love it. And uh, I also want to sh share with you is that, you know, we are part of um, the, as a, as a concept, you know, we're very caught up with education and that's the strategic relationship we've had is sponsoring education uh, through Bitcoin magazine. Uh, and it's something that I've done through my funds. And in fact, I have a weekly blog that has a hundred thousand readers in 80 countries and it's all about education. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, shout out to Joe Rogers from the print team who's been putting together uh, wonderful educational content in the in the By the Numbers series. And uh, in our most recent recent edition in the primary issue right behind me, uh, we have a good breakdown of electricity pricing in the U.S. and kind of his outlook um, for miners as we approach the halving. So uh, another good, great rip uh, by Joe Rogers, as always. Um, but uh, Aiden as well, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for taking the time. We love what you guys do at Bitcoin Magazine. Yeah, fantastic. Really looking forward to uh, talking. I mean, there's so much to talk about right now. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of FUD, as, as always. Uh, we're going to get into that. Um, but I think, you know, before we do that, we'll give our audience a little bit of a background for each of you. Um, so, Aiden, I think we might start with you and, and just discuss how it is you ended up working with Hive. And I know previously you were with Cathedra. I mean, I think people would just be interested in your background um, and you know, how you found your way over to working with Frank. Well, Hive was the first public crypto miner ever. It went public in September of 2017. And when I saw that story and I saw Hive hit a billion dollar market cap in a month, uh, it was this kind of eureka moment because I knew uh, people that were mining. I had set up a mine with some friends 
in uh, BC. And so anyways, uh, that was a signal that, you know, it was, it was uh, not too early. If anything, it was, it was the perfect time to get into the space. So I actually founded Fortress Blockchain, um, raised 20 million bucks, took it public and because I was really inspired by what Frank had done. And um, that uh, led me, uh, you know, Frank likes to say we got baptized by fire because, you know, everyone loves you when Bitcoin's 20,000 in December 2017. And then we endured, you know, pretty much a two year bear market and, and a halving event and a bunch of uh, political turmoil, uh, et cetera. And so um, in January, or sorry, summer of 2021, uh, I joined Hive as present COO. I uh, arranged a succession plan with uh, AJ and Drew, who are now running uh, Cathedra. They rebranded it uh, a few months after, uh, which was great. And I've been a, a champion of, of uh, their efforts. Um, but, you know, since I've been uh, growing with Hive, there's just so much happening in our our multiverse um as you know we used to be one of the world's largest ethereum miners we uh built a 70 megawatt site in new brunswick actually that was sort of how i got my beak wet joining hive i flew out to new brunswick during the pandemic to um, have a look at this phenomenal site that frank had his eye on and frank um really made two key acquisitions in the last bear market uh in la chute and of course the other being new brunswick and with the resources of Hive and intellectual capital, um, you know, we, we grew that site. It was an incomplete 30 megawatts when we acquired it, and now it's a fully functional 70 megawatts. And, you know, since then, we've done so much stuff. We've pivoted through the Ethereum merge. We could talk more about that later into HPC and AI compute. We built our own uh, ASIC miner with um, with Intel BlockScale's ASIC. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've maintained one of the, if not the best, uh, Bitcoin prex a hash up times in the sector all along the way. Yeah, fantastic. And I think that piece of navigating the Ethereum merge and your use of GPUs in your current facilities is something like very unique in the Bitcoin mining sector. Um, and something, you know, I, I hadn't even considered is like, how do you go from using these GPUs to mine something like Ethereum? And then as it moved away from proof of work, like what is that navigating that market like? So um, I think, you know, that's going to be something we can unpack. Um, and as well, I think the geographic distribution of, of Hive's hash rate and data centers is interesting, too. Um, I know you have Iceland, Norway and Canada. So that's um, very interesting to, to consider. Um, and then, Frank, I think if you could just tell us a little bit more about your background with um, U.S. global investors and, uh, of course, your, your work with Hive. Um, and then we can kind of dive in a little bit more into the, the more granular side of things. Thanks, Spencer. Well, I am a fund manager, F-U-N, and, um, and it's good to have fun looking for new opportunities and growth. I've been known for the world of gold. Uh, I've been involved in the creation of many gold mining companies, and in particular the royalty, gold royalty model. Uh, and, and I had launched the JETS ETF in 2015, and I was trying to launch in 2017 a Bitcoin ETF, and we're almost at 2024, and we still don't have it out yet. Um, there's no you know, Bitcoin ETF. And the concerns at the time when I was doing my due diligence both in Canada and the U.S. was AML and KYC. And, and, and on that homework, realize that Bitcoin mining, you mine the virgin coin, the Genesis coin, you don't have a KYC or AML problem. And if you can hodl it, you then have this sort of unique coin and even make it more unique was to be green and clean only sources of energy uh, because you can track wherever that Bitcoin has been. So therefore, I believe is my collection of art that if you have a, an original Andy Warhol, um, even a print of Mao in, it came out at $1,000, went to $100,000. Uh, if you limit supply and you get adoption, prices grow up. That's what we're experiencing in Bitcoin. So the path of going from gold as a decentralized asset and going into Bitcoin was was easier than for a lot of my peers my age. But I was literally trying to launch this ETF. The launch of, of Hive was unique uh, because it was the first, but it was also mining Ethereum. And it was with GPUs in Iceland and then spread out, go to Sweden. Uh, so it started off right out of the gate as an international crypto mining company. Uh, and, and during the last halving, in particular, uh, we did two substantial acquisitions and, and critical in that whole journey has been Aiden that came along, as you mentioned earlier. But we, we drive our business model is on the highest cash flow returns on invested capital. Uh, and that's something that we're very proud of. And when we first launched it, it exploded on the upside. 
Fidelity gave us $100 million. Uh, other institutions gave us $100 million, and away we were. And, but we lived through that bear market. And through that bear market, the expertise in GPU ch uh, chips and mining Ethereum allowed us to actually make money through the halving. Everyone else got penalized. But it was, mm. it was an actual interesting learning curve. The other part was we had many original Hive shareholders came from the gold space that were reluctant to go into a crypto exchange, but they bought Hive as a proxy for Bitcoin miners and Ethereum. Well, Ethereum had one time 30 million kids that were turning on their computers after they went to bed. Uh, they left them on to, from their gaming and were mining Ethereum. And I had a paper route as a kid, but these kids all mined Ethereum, and over a year they might mine one or two coins. Well, that could have been $5,000. So that's a lot of money for a kid. Uh, and so we participated in that growth of that ecosystem. Immediately behind us came HUD-8, and then in the U.S. was Riot, and other players have come into it. Um, but we're, the, I think, the only standing management team that have lived through the halving, lived through where proof of stake uh, was gone for Ethereum, or proof of work uh, was gone to come to proof of stake. So we've had a lot of lessons that we've learned from the, those journeys. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I can just hear the uh, the Bitcoin maximalist in me, you know, kind of cringing at the word Ethereum. But I think uh, from a business standpoint, it's absolutely fascinating to consider how to manage that transition from proof of stake or proof of work to proof of stake. Um, and AI is such a hot topic right now. And there is that confluence of using those GPUs to compute AI cycles um, rather than mining uh, Ethereum. Um, and so I think that's going to be something we can really unpack here. Um, but first of all, I want to give people an understanding of what Hive's management philosophy is and how it's structuring its balance sheet. I think Bitcoin miners have been highly correlated with the Bitcoin price, even representing a greater upside as of late. Um, and that's even despite hash price being low or, or the revenue that miners receive uh, per hash in terms of the, its dollar value. Um, and so I, I want to help understand, you know, why, what the investment thesis is behind a Bitcoin mining company um, and how Hive is approaching that. I know there's a lot of discussion around should miners hold the commodity as after they produce it? Um, should they be recycling those that revenue directly back into their infrastructure? Um, so I just want to give you guys the opportunity to talk about it, it, how to do that. Spencer, Spencer is a very significant question that we have at board meetings and a regular basis. Um, there is a thought out there just to loot the hell of your company to sell shares and buy equipment. Um, and and then the other part was what you see is 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 just hold as much as you can. Uh, we have tried to do both and really protect the dilution. So if you look in the past 12 months, uh, we've had you know the least amount of dilution of the large crypto mining companies. Some of them are 103, threefold increase in the number of shares outstanding. And it's a trade-off. Do we sell some, some Bitcoin to go and buy machines or do we sell shares? And what is going to impact that return on invested capital? So we run it like a, a, a sophisticated fund manager would. Uh, the company and and it's driven on that cash flow return on invested capital and we're always second guessing ourselves. We wish we could hold everything. Uh, we wish that because uh, we're very 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 bullish on Bitcoin uh, and and uh, but you have to have this trade off. So we we function with it. But what we did learn and I can give you such great granularity is that when we bought our Nvidia chips, other miners bought Nvidia chips, but they were single purpose only to mine Ethereum. We bought more expensive chips because we believed long term the HPC was going to be an important avenue of business. And whenever this proof of, of uh, work to stake would happen, that we could pivot. Uh, we never thought it would happen so fast as GBT chat would have done. I mean, it's just been incredible what's taking place. But we're the only ones that really have the expertise and experience with GPU chips and now building out our HPC. Our chips allowed us to pivot. So when when Ethereum was gone, we immediately started mining using AI, all the all the other we call the shit coins, and convert them to Bitcoin immediately. So it was ever the most attractive coin that we wouldn't impact its, its our return on invested capital. We would mine, sell, convert, and that's how we started functioning after the the um, uh, Ethereum left 
the, the I think the safe ecosystem proof of work and gone to proof of stake, which is a big, big mistake, I think. But be that as it may, we have turned around and said, okay, let's be building and building on our HPC and it's taking off. Um, we did a quarter million dollars in the first quarter. We made public statements that we would be up to a quarter million dollars a month, which we just hit. Um, by March, our year end, I think we'll be at a quarter million dollars a week. And if we keep on this trajectory, we'll be at a quarter million dollars a day this time next year. So what does that mean? It means we have a big, bigger margin, a, a profit margin that allows us to buy more Bitcoin machinery and infrastructure to continuously build out that Bitcoin machinery and to be able to hold it. Um, and so we're very excited about that. And Iden has become... Uh, you know, just steeped in learning everything about this space, and he's dragging me off tomorrow to San Francisco. I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to fly there uh, for a AI um, conference. Hmm. Yeah, fantastic. And and I don't know if there's anything you want to add there as far as maybe your Bitcoin allocation strategy at Hive um, or, or any additional color around that uh, management of the GPUs. I think uh, I'm all ears. Yeah. So one one. I guess there's numerous additional layers of consideration. When you have, we we almost manage hash rate as, or energy as, as a primary resource, because for example, uh, last year in 2022, we had uh, GPUs that could mine Ethereum up until the merge. We sold power back to the grid in Sweden and made over $3 million in one month uh, because we had your contracts. And otherwise, that energy could be used to uh, hash on ASICs to earn Bitcoin, right? So we've, you know, become masters of hash rate economics because we're always studying what is the best allocation of our resources, right? And to put more color on that, when you're deploying capital and everyone has just kind of got one track, they're like, okay, which ASIC should we buy? During the ETH mining era, we were like, well, hmm, we could buy GPUs right now. What's the ROI on that? Getting back to Frank's fundamental core strategy of best cash flow return on invested capital. Now, another thing to keep in mind, Ethereum mining was about three to four times more profit dense uh, than Bitcoin per kilowatt. So what I mean is we had ETH mining GPUs that were doing 90 cents, 90 cents a kilowatt hour in revenue, right? And this is at a time when, you know, it was a better Bitcoin mining market. We were seeing 20 cents a kilowatt hour on a 15 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour right so that's that's a huge multiple and we had we had older generation uh eth gpus that were doing still 40 50 cents a kilowatt hour so all of a sudden you realize wow you know we were doing 150 grand a day out of 22 megawatts of eth mining right and so you suddenly it becomes a more complicated puzzle to solve because it's not just the unit economics, it's also, well, wow, we could fit way more GPUs in a megawatt and it's more profit dense per energy, right? And so we would explain this stuff and, you know, some of the smarter analysts would get it and, you know, I'll go to conference and the other propeller heads will come up and they're all excited about it, but we never really got a premium for it in the broader sector, right? Which was frustrating to say the least. All it was, well, 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 uh, magic, um, uh, you know, unicorn uh, goes to proof of stake then what and it, it was almost sort of like um you know this this uh, foregone conclusion that eventually was going to come so no premium was described fine right then the eth merge happened and i could speak to it very succinctly right we were doing uh, about 75 percent of the revenue per kilowatt hour with our gpus post merge than that of asics okay Right. So this was like back in we, we were doing about 30,000 a day with our GPUs. And if we were running 30 joule per terash machines, this is all for all your enthusiasts out there, all your hardcore guys. We were doing we would have been doing 40,000 a day uh, in that same footprint if it was ASIC. So think about that. This is everyone saying, no, it's going to go to zero. You're going to be dead. No, it's not. As you know, hash rate economics, everything's asymptotic. Nothing ever like falls to zero, right? It's all as the guys with the cheapest operating costs will, mm -hmm. will flourish and survive. We had three cent power in Sweden. We had some of the most efficient GPU chips on the planet because we had bought enterprise grade NVIDIA RTX GPUs with tensor core architecture, which by the way, could do AI compute workloads that Frank mm -hmm. was alluding to. 
and some of our peers had just jumped into the ETH mining game as we were doing it, um, bought the CMP series, which were one trick ponies. So I say this because right at the worst point post merge, we came out, we pulled out that nosedive. We're still, we're still, uh, you know, breaking even and profitable even. And then we had altcoin rally and it, for a time we're earning more from the GPUs than ASICs on a per hmm. kilowatt hour basis, hmm. right? Mining, but now it's blown out of the water because we could get $2 a kilowatt hour running high performance workloads on the GPUs, two bucks a kilowatt hour. For simplicity, you're making 10 cents mining an hour revenue with ASIC chips and you're making over a dollar doing HPC. So two bucks, two bucks revenue, Frank. Yes, yeah. simple way yeah. to look at it. But you know what I'm really proud of of our team, and, and Aiden is, is humble here. He's a electrical engineer, and he, he loves to put everything into joules and kilowatts, which is so great as he's lifted the bar uh, of, of what we do. But we're the first to balance the grid. That idea came from what we were first. We were first to uh, buy our own data center and build our own data center. Uh, we were the first to uh, recycle the energy from hydroelectricity. We're, the, we're still the only pure gr uh, green the hydro and geothermal electricity, other people branched off to gas or, or nuclear and uh, some got into got spanked for going to coal, but we've stayed really green and clean in, in our business model. And and so I, I take a look at, we were the first to hold, we were the first to be 100% green. Uh, in, in, in Montreal, we recycle the energy to heat a building five times bigger. Uh, we're looking at building a greenhouse 100 miles south of the Arctic Circle. So we're really an innovative group. And, and, and I think that's what's really important, Spencer, is that Aiden is, a, is the electrical engineer and we have lots of technical people around and we're always trying to think of how do we squeeze uh, that last drop of juice or the orange uh, and, and that nice orange color we like. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, and no, I think that you you paint a really beautiful picture of what the mining industry has done over time with this move towards renewable energy. I think that's um, I think ever since Elon Musk kind of brought that talking point into the limelight, you know, there's been Greenpeace hopping on board. Uh, people like Alex DeVries coming out with uh, new FUD that loves to get circulated. But I think that there really is a narrative violation going on in, in the mining sector. I think people like yourself and many other miners are using, are looking at the economics and saying, what is the best way to compute? And, and the energy input is going is increasingly becoming uh, renewable energy and surplus energy. Um, and I think that that continues to evolve. Um, but before we move away- And, and, and you know, Spencer, what we did to educate is that we took the first um, a couple of presentations by Michael Saylor and creating the Mining Council and thank him for his leadership and stewardship in creating that to deal with Elon Musk but 30 minutes is a long time for a particular millennials and generation X, mm. Y, and Z. So we condensed it to three minutes, that presentation, and we did it in Swedish to educate Swedish politicians and, mm. and uh, anti-FUD uh, NGOs. Uh, we, we did it in French, uh, we did it in Spanish, and we did it in English. So we went really in that channel of trying to dilute the FUD that's out there with information that's 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 take home value because we're really caught up why sponsoring your publication is this about education. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, we, we sincerely appreciate that. And uh, again, Joe Rogers uh, working on the print mag has done a great job with the by the number series. Um, again, shout out to him and, uh, you know, always a great job that that team does. Um, and and that the last kind of piece before we move more deeply into this this FUD that I want to try to understand is when you're managing these data centers that have GPUs and data centers that have ASIC chips, are those two operations always going to be separate from one another? And, and kind of my thinking is that you have perhaps a base load power demand for ASIC mining, and then you have perhaps intermittent demand for compute from the AI front. Is that a correct way of thinking about it? Or do you guys have any more well, broad when, thoughts on how that market when might evolve. When you balance the grid, you're going to, that means uh, drop to 3%, 5% of your energy consumption. Um, and and when you're HPC, you're 99.9% .9 uptime. So mm. you, can't, you can't be balancing the grid. So they do have to go down two different paths of consumption of electricity. 
uh, data centers for HPC consume about one tenth. So we we're talking earlier, I and I, and for just simple numbers, to do a hundred million in revenue of Bitcoin mining, you need about a hundred megawatts. Uh, roughly, I think that's roughly the number, right, Iden? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it shifts. Get 100 million but, uh, in yeah. revenue in HPC, you only need 10 megawatts mm. of, of electricity. Uh, but the same FUD that goes up against just Bitcoin miners is really going against data centers, period. So we've had to wrestle with the FUD against data centers. And you just won't believe some of these politicians that believe that that Netflix, you know, that, that, they, that your phones, your iPhone, everything's free. The internet is free. No, if you don't have a data center, you have nothing that's digital. And Bitcoin is a critical part of the great digital transformation uh, that's taken place globally. But it all happens around the use of energy and data centers. Uh, and, and so with that, you know, we continue to wrestle with, you know, why Ethereum, why this, why that? Um, but deep down, I'm a gold guy. Deep down, I understand the importance of, of alternative asset classes in everyone's portfolio and, um, and, and, and being able to say that we mine and hold virgin coins uh, on our balance sheet uh, says that Hive ha and, and they're all green gives a unique proposition. Hmm. Yeah, I think that aspect of renewable energy being the source for Hive's operations is an interesting consideration. I know that there's a lot of talk about um, the social license to operate. I think it's important to note that Bitcoin miners uh, do operate within jurisdictions and they have to you know, be able to work with communities to be able to operate long term. It's not. And I think that opens up a conversation about, you know, globalization of the mining industry. Perhaps you could find super cheap energy in, say, Russia prior to the Russia-Ukraine war. But that would have been, you know, that would have been a, a mistake business wise. You would have you know, lost out so much. And um, and I think it's important to think about um, the overall management of an operation from a, a risk management perspective. And that, that social risk is, is one that you, I think, are alluding to. It's really important you bring that up, Spencer, because in the gold royalty business, um, you do not want to go into countries like Russia. Uh, a big reason is unless it's a common law structures. And, and common law was the real creation of private property rights. And from private property rights came human rights, because prior to that, there were serfs. Uh, everyone, the king owned everything and everyone. So that whole concept started in the Magna Carta in 1215. And it's evolved. Uh, and it's, to me, fascinating because these other countries, even in Latin America, and you go over to Africa, you have to be really caught up with private property rights. Well, what is the best digital asset class in the world for private property rights? It's Bitcoin. Bitcoin is all about private property. And, and the, what's unique and special, it's capped at 21 million. Gold is not capped at the production uh, one part. But when royalty companies go into these other jurisdictions in Latin America, they do everything through a common law structure because they pr common law protects private property the best. So mm. we would never go directly into a country like Russia because there's, there's, no, pro there's no property rights. Mm. Yeah, no, really well said. Um, I think that's some very interesting color to add, bringing over your experience from the gold sector. Um, and I think kind of the the last piece on this, uh, you know, energy subject that I want to touch on is a little bit more granularly is um, this new FUD that's coming around where it says uh, Bitcoin mining uses a swimming pool's worth of water per transaction. Um, and I, I don't remember, you know, purchasing a swimming pool last time I sent some Bitcoin. Um, I, I think that'd be pretty expensive to get that much water. So I don't know. I don't know who's paying for my transactions, but uh, I appreciate it. No, but but uh, all, all jokes aside, I think um, I don't really want to address the the FUD and granularity. I think it's a nonsensical argument. Alex DeVries, in, in my opinion, I, I believe him to be deeply conflicted and biased. Um, but all of that aside, I, I just would like to maybe get a temperature check on, you know, where do you do you see the Bitcoin narrative as having made progress in terms of FUD or are we still fighting um, what's seemingly been an uphill battle as, as there seem to be, you know, opponents coming out of the woodwork. Um, where, do, where are we in that process? Oh, I think that you're going to continue. It will help when the ETF comes out, in my experience, mm -hmm. in the gold space. So when the GLD came out, 
um, uh, the, the regulatory world was always anti gold mining stocks and gold mining funds. They were always suspect and everyone was bad promoters. And it was always okay. a sort of a, a, a horrible con- con- reputation that you had to always deal with. Uh, when the GLD came, GLD came out, all of a sudden that narrative of regulatory attack in the gold mining industry sort of stopped. And um, if they're bad characters, bad characters, but as a whole blanket. Uh, I think that's what's going to happen with Bitcoin. I, I think that when the ETF comes out, that, that the, the, RS, the IRAs and people with 401ks can all of a sudden buy this ETF that has Bitcoin, the government can see where it is, etc., gives them a great comfort level. And, and I think that um, the attack on the industry will will improve and but change, but will always be sort of suspect because it is an alternative asset class and it is about private property rights. So once you just have to, how do you navigate that? But the serious stuff is what the gold mining industries had to do with the FUD for, um, like Greenpeace and what they've gone out and said, uh, how much damage has been done to the environment uh, by gold mining companies. What the biggest damage I ever saw was actually uneducated local people in Latin America and Africa. I, 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 I hmm. saw that. But when you brought in Canadian miners and, and brilliant and smart engineers like uh, Iden, uh, the standards of care changed. A guy like Iden, if he was a gold miner, uh, what he would have done in Mexico is he would have built a school system, a hospital care system. And that's what that's what the Canadian gold mining companies did. They knew all about ESG before it became a word. Uh, and, and the standards of care uh, are at another level. So I, I think that, that this is what's going to happen here is that you're, you, the gold mining industry still has to fight the Greenpeace type of thought process, but it will overcome that. And we will overcome the other parts as long as we keep educating and, and having these high standards of care, something that I know Aiden is very cautious about because we run these these big transformers that bring electricity in so you have to be so careful about the quality of the, of the work so that people are safe for what they're doing yeah and i think your your mention of uh you know the etfs in the context of green pieces fud is really funny i know they put larry fink's image on uh some i, I think they said that they projected some like anti-bitcoin messaging onto buildings in new york city I think they may have photoshopped it, but that might just be an opinion of mine. But nonetheless, you know, they, they're, they're going after Larry Fink a little bit. And, um, you know, I think he's going to, he's really changing the conversation so much, saying calling Bitcoin a flight to safety. And, um, you know, I have mixed opinions about BlackRock in terms of, um, you know, centralization of, of, or that might not be the correct word, but um, concentration of asset management um, and how that industry functions. But at the end of the day, um, he's really gonna, going to change the narrative. Um, and I think... I want to help understand also if Hive has a particular outlook on this whole ETF conversation as we approach the having. Um, well, do you guys have any Spencer, Spencer, just to help you with that, I think we all have to realize we have had consultants um, that are lobbyists, young people that are lobbyists outside of the normal channel in D.C. and in Canada. And, and, and what you find is, and what they've told us, uh, is that the advocacy against crypto mining, uh, a lot of it comes from climate change fanaticism. And, and it's, it's money that the, the, you know, the world is coming to an end because of climate change. And, and that thought process is embedded in the UN. It's embedded in World Economic Forum. They both feed into each other. You can see that in the politics in Canada. You can see it in various states are different. But it's really what we wrestle with is how do we tell a better narrative and, and explain to people climate change. But if they're really religious fanatics over climate change, no matter what you say, doesn't matter. That's the sad part. But we have to make sure that the marginal person is better informed, uh, that, that we are not hurting. Because when you take a look at what we do when we recycle hydroelectricity to heat a building from 40,000 to 200,000 square feet, and then when we finish this uh, 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 facility in Sweden, uh, we'll be able to provide all the uh, vegetables in the northern part of, of that. They won't have to import anything from Italy or Spain. There'll be no carbon mm. footprint. Uh, it, it's just continuous education, but the battle really is climate change fanatics, and they're well-funded. Uh, they're the ones that fund uh, uh, Greenpeace. 
Yeah, well, I, I think, too, it's interesting you brought up the World Economic Forum, where they've actually talked about a company like Crusoe Energy um, using waste methane to mine Bitcoin. But in their kind of uh, press coverage of that, the, the World Economic Forum omitted the word Bitcoin. And um, it is going to be interesting to see how capital changes the message that's pushed out from these various channels. Um, and over time, I, that's kind of my bull case for Bitcoin from an institutional perspective is you're going to have you know, energy infrastructure and institutional investors in the energy space that are recognizing the value of this technology. And it's going to change the political constituencies underneath that. Um, so I, ultimately, I think I'm rather bullish on on how the narrative will evolve, but um, it might be taking a little bit longer than I would prefer at, at, the, at the present moment. Yeah, I, I also found from my experience in the gold bug world, is that there's a lot of gold bugs, um, but really they don't own, they don't own much gold. They really are just protesting against government. Uh, mm. They're really not even libertarians. They're just uh, to me, you know, radical hippies. Uh, that uh, and I've been to so many conferences over my 35 years living in Texas, uh, and 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 seen and heard them and find out they don't own much gold. And sometimes I wonder if the real fanatics on Bitcoin is it really do, how much Bitcoin do they own? Uh, I own more than them, and uh, and and it's having this sort of balanced perspective. Um, uh, that's what I hope. I, yeah, what do you I, think of in your experience of the Bitcoin ecosystem? I mean, I personally held Bitcoin for years now. My I have a long view on it. I don't I don't plan to sell it anytime soon. I think that. With the advent of the Lightning Network and you know the uh, interesting layer two aspects that are being developed, there's a really cool ecosystem of upstarts and entrepreneurs that are trying to uh, create a framework for people to use Bitcoin as as payment. But I still think that people fundamentally see it as a store of value. Um, it just and it's a decentralized energy backed currency. Uh, really having uh, Bitcoin mines scattered around the world, having the nodes there uh, thereafter, uh, it's robust. I mean, it's we're, we're in 14 years. And I think that now, you know, as for, I think you commented that maybe Larry Fink had some anti-Bitcoin stuff spray painted around New York. Maybe you thought oh, that it was, was uh, Greenpeace using Larry Fink's image to paint a, a bad picture of Bitcoin. I mean, Larry Fink had, in the past has said uh, index of mon money laundering, et cetera, I believe. Um, apologies yeah. if that was Jamie Dimon, but <laughs> probably Jamie Dimon. Um, okay. I think I think BlackRock obviously is interested in, in having um, a stake in the Bitcoin game vis-a-vis -vis the ETF. So really when the powers that be on the finance side right so the black rocks of the world i mean fidel has been one of the greatest supporters i think uh in the space with abigail johnson you know being a seed investor in, in hive and fortress um and you know they even mine at fidelity i think that they all they really whether it's blackrock or fidelity they're just trying to figure out what's their in how, how are they going to have a piece in the game right and so some of them thought okay well maybe we can invest in crypto miners um, now you see BlackRock index in some large cap companies that are maybe on the Russell 3000, but I don't think that they're really looking at value investing. They're trading crypto miners as like a quant basket with like secondary exposure to Bitcoin price. Mm. And so, you know, they'll just, they'll just invest in, in a few of them because primarily our prices all move with the, with the price of Bitcoin. Um, but moreover, I mean, with the ETF, that was BlackRock's way of, of getting there and, you know, the other big players that, that want exposure. And so then they're going to come around and be like, okay, well, now, now we'll support it. Um, on, on the energy side of things, I think like, you know, the big energy asset owners, like, you know, even guys like Warren Buffett, who from my understanding is kind of anti-Bitcoin, if they realize, wow, this is really an energy backed currency uh, and they could utilize energy resources because, you know, energy is expensive to store energy is expensive to transport. That's why Bitcoin mining can be set up remotely. Whether you talk about Crusoe, um, well, you know, Cathedral is also doing that too, where they were mining with, mining with flared gas. And the idea is that it reduces methane that goes into the atmosphere, which is which is a great concept. But, um, you know, if, if there's any sort of, whether it's hydro, uh, anything that's being produced remotely, like our mine in Sweden is in Northern Sweden, 30 kilometers from the Arctic Circle, right? And so as Frank mentioned, our, our vision is to, A, we're utilizing power in a region 
where power production occurs, but there's not a lot of consumption because it's remote. Stockholm's in the south of Sweden. All the all the consumption is mm -hmm. in the south. But what do you have to do? You have to transport it. Transporting is lossy from physics, right? Um, and it's expensive because you have to build the infrastructure. So if you can have uh, uh, economic use of surplus energy through Bitcoin mining, I think that it allows... Um, people that own energy assets to have an exciting uh, new venture. And so hopefully we, the, the same way we saw like the, the juggernauts like BlackRock eventually take a liking to Bitcoin. Why? Because, well, they had a reason to benefit from it. It's the same way I hope that big energy players realize, wow, this could be great. And in America too, you know, I, I, Frank and I were at a conference in Houston and one of the speakers, he, he coined Bitcoin the American electro dollar, which I think mm. is, is great. And, and then the thing is, I, the other aspects of the ecosystem too, I mean, like we, we've seen a rally uh, in transaction fees recently, um, whereby ordinals really um, were driving a lot of demand on the Bitcoin side of the business, uh, which behooves miners as well. But it also shows an end use case where it's not just um, people looking at Bitcoin as a store of value, but they're, they're attaching the ability to encode information on the blockchain, which I think in, in kind of a, a fun, um, whimsical way, having having ordinals and uh, our artwork attached to it. But really the, the underlying uh, principles that you now can have information on the blockchain as well as just transactions. And where does that take us, right? So, you know, it's, it's kind of like we're going from having phones that you could text with to smartphones, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that leap, that inflection point in society I think it will really evolve how people interact and use Bitcoin on a day-to-day -day basis. And when people use Bitcoin, um, and look, it could be other countries in South America that have rampant inflation, they view it as a more secure currency than their own native currency, um, or just, just people that realize that the, there's so much money printing in the U.S. and having an energy-backed currency with in, implicit scarcity, uh, obviously the lock word has as time approaches you know, um, I, I just want to add, you know, uh, Aiden, is that life, we're alive because of energy. And to make a, a brick of gold, you need energy. And to make a Bitcoin, you need energy. And energy is everything. And the value of a human being is, is it all comes down to the, this energy. It's recognizing the importance of it. And I, and I don't think that, uh, I think Bitcoin is, is this phenomenal better than uh, Jupiter, the famous uh, Mozart's 21st symphony. It's so the math behind it is just phenomenal. Um, mm. and, and when you look at the elegance of it uh, and, and, and you take it forward, then you say ordinals come along. Well, this guy, Casey, he was at Rodermar. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I mean, this guy's like a, uh, another young uh, creative uh, Mozart, you know, writing this script for the ecosystem. Uh, there's only there's one composer in the writing symphonies. This guy writes this, and we can see how it, the significance of the Bitcoin uh, network of 13,000 nodes. Um, so I, I think that uh, I think I said he's ranked as the number one influencer in the Bitcoin ecosystem this past year. Um, and I understand why the idea that you could take this piece of art or a picture of me and my daughter this when she was born and attach it to a Satoshi. And we had this experience with our Satoshis, which are worth 0 0.0001 of a penny. All of a sudden, uh, we're, they're worth a quarter million dollars. Uh, because you have magical numbers. Well, this comes back that Bitcoin's capped at 21 million and more people believe in it, therefore it grows exponentially according to Metcalf's law. Same thing with ordinals. If you have explicit number and I can tie it to the day you graduate from university, a picture of you graduating, I could find that Bitcoin that day, that number, and attach it to a photograph of you graduating from university. Aha, what's that ordinal worth? Something that's point zero zero one all of a sudden is worth twenty five dollars. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think it's it's fascinating to explore that, and I think they for myself, the, they need our network. They need, and, and I'll share with something else. And uh, we have to deal with FUD. Is is Hive has to deal with a FUD? Um, I, I I noticed that uh, saw it again today that we were supposed to have the highest Bitcoin cost to mine, but we have the lowest GNA per Bitcoin to mine, but we have the low, highest cost. Um, and, and, and those would actually have the highest costs are omitted from those bar charts. So the FUD that's in the industry 
comes right down individually to us as a, as a group. And uh, so I, I think it's an interesting debate and discussion how you have to navigate through the FUD and make sure that you create this sort of balanced story. But I'm so bullish with the whole th on ordinals and the network, uh, decentralized network around the world. Our data centers, what we're doing in HPC is about being decentralized. Um, there is a great concern that if you put a picture on Facebook as now Facebook's picture, well, if you create a code for AI, then all of a sudden you've done it at AW, uh, you've done it with Azure or some one of these big platforms. Is it theirs? Is it yours? Is if you use GPT chat, is it theirs? Is it yours? Who owns it? But you wrote the code. It's your musical score. And so the idea of the decentralized data centers, I think Aiden has hit on this so well, this is very, very important for all the innovators that are out there uh, that are looking to create something, uh, how they can use an our B2B business model in the HPC. So we're really relating to the, Bit the early Bitcoin adopters that were coding. Well, yeah, I think I'm, I might express a little bit more tempered of a view personally on ordinals. But what I think at the end of the day is so interesting is that people are using Bitcoin for social signaling. Um, and whether or not there's going to be a long term market value for a specific inscription, I, I, I can't say. But I think at the end of the day is it's showing that there are new and innovative ways that people want to use this technology. And I think it just from a security budget perspective. I know it's a fairly nuanced discussion, but I think that there's going to be things with Bitcoin that we can't even begin to predict, but I'm excited that there are people that are passionate about that, um, like you are, clearly, Frank, and like people like Casey Rodimore who are impassioned to create these types of things. I think it just speaks to the creativity and the culture that we have in Bitcoin. And um, in, on that note, on, on you know the, the culture, for, for everyone listening, I know we talked about you know, Greenpeace, the World Economic Forum, Ordinals, Ethereum. So everyone should be like plenty triggered by now if you're, a, you know, a, a mainline Bitcoin maxi. But um, at the end of the day, I think that what we're doing here is we're exploring narratives. And, and I think um, we need to stress test all these narratives. And, and I think Ordinals has done a good job of that. Um, and, it, you know, it brings in the adoption. You bring in the art, you bring in the cultural world. Uh, you, you create the value. You know, I have a, a Picasso print back here. Well, that's that when it first came out wasn't worth much, but as adoption of Picasso is important, all of a sudden it starts to climb. Uh, and, and, and people project if you're a Bitcoin maximist, well, if if you think Bitcoin's going to 100,000, you think it's going to a million, then if it's at a million dollars, what is a Satoshi worth? I mean, it would, it would depend on, I guess, now that you've- A penny? It, like if, a, if a Satoshi's at a penny and you have 100 million pennies, how much money is that, Aiden? Where's your calculator there? You get a million dollars. So what happens if all of a sudden we get paid $10? So it says, well, some of you're crazy, Frank, to think that Bitcoin can go to a million dollars. And I go, well, why not? If, 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 if you have enough Satoshis and, and Satoshi is 0 0.00001 and all of a sudden it's valued at $10, yeah, it, it's very conceivable because we have 8 billion people and they're all having babies right now. You know, half the world is is, is out there, is dark, and, and it's alive and it's vibrant, and and they're going to turn around and want something that's digital. So I think it's it's very easy when you do this prediction of where you think Bitcoin can go to. Uh, the fact that it's capped at twenty one million, it's going to go down into these satoshis, and those satoshis are all of a sudden being discovered because of ordinals. That brings more people into our realm and the, our metaverse of the Bitcoin crypto ecosystem. And and that's the exciting ride. Yeah, and uh, on, I know we you tossed out a kind of a, a price there of a million dollars. And uh, obviously this is a, a bit of an unfair question, but uh, Aiden and Frank, I would just you know be curious to ask how you guys think the price of Bitcoin may react to the halving uh, coming up. And I think you know this is also in the context of a potential spot ETF, but um, I'm curious if Hive has an outlook or if you just have your own your own personal uh, outlook on, on what what the uh, the price may do going forward. All the guys with old machines will get crushed like it happened last time. Uh, the difficulty will drop. It's continuing to rise. I mean, uh, I will give you a I was the data point you gave me the other day. Three years ago, we were getting four Bitcoin and Exahash. What was the number you were giving? Yeah, me? so I, I could speak to it, uh, Spencer. So, you know, historically what we saw, if you study the last time difficulty dropped as a result of 
hash price dipping. It was last December, it was a year ago. It was November, December last year. Hash price was about 55 bucks a petahash per day. And at that level, uh, 50 joule per terahash machines were uh, not profitable at five cents. And so there's been so many more new generation machines. I think that the S19J Pro at 30 joules a terahash will kind of become um, the next break even miner at about five cents post having. And so for that, it would be something like a $35 hash, or sorry, $35 a petahash hmm. um, hash price. And that's just a prediction. That's just a target. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, 35, 36 bucks a petahash. And, and so, you know, there's just these, there's just these like local minima where you see the network only able, only able to substand a certain level of hash price degradation before it becomes unprofitable. But, you know, at, at a $36 hash price, for example, 36 bucks a petahash a day, if you have a 30 joule machine, you're going to be break even at 3.9 cents a kilowatt hour. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, it, 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 really, it really depends, but there's, there's just like the natural atrophy of scarcity. I mean, what Frank's referring to is last year, you know, it was like roughly yeah, four one, Bitcoin, one, one four extra hash Bitcoin. equaled how much a day was it? Four, I four, four, four Bitcoin a day. And in March it was down to three, roughly 3.25 Bitcoin a day. And now we're down to roughly, you know, two Bitcoin a day per exahash. Um, and that's block reward. So you'll have transaction fees on top of that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that. So so next year is going to be half a Bitcoin, right? It's going to be one exahash is going to equal half a Bitcoin. Yeah, if we do a linear So Bitcoin has to go to 60,000. Yeah, if we do a linear extrapolation of difficulty increase, it'll be one Bitcoin a day uh, next year. Uh, but if you compound the halving event onto that, that would be half a Bitcoin a day per exahash. Um, and that's, that's sort of, you know, looking at linear regression. But if you look at uh, a local minima approach where you consider historical hash prices and just the advent of more efficient machines, I think like a mid thirties hash price is, is what we might see, but e either way, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is going to grow in scarcity. And that really, um, supports my earlier thesis is that it's, it's a decentralized scarce energy backed currency. And so I think that, um, the idea of, you know, there's more and more U.S. dollars printed with time, but there's only a finite amount of Bitcoin. And, and that's obvious, but you, you really think of the impact with that. Where are we going to be in five years from now when you all of these and with information being able to be stored on the Bitcoin blockchain, right? It will just create more demand. And, and I think that um, Lightning in Layer 2 will allow people um, to fit more transactions per block. So I think it's all super exciting. Um, but, you know, hash rate will get commodified. Right, like a S21 produces 200 terahash, and uh, the S19 J Pro produced 100 terahash, and the S9 back in the day produced 13 terahash. So, hash rate will get cheaper to produce. So, as Frank was saying, you will just earn less Bitcoin per hash. As we can almost accept that as an axiom of, of, of Bitcoin mining, right? It would, it mm -hmm. would, you know, you just have to operate on that, and you can kind of predict um, troughs, but you what you can predict is how long they'll last that's the only challenging thing because there's macroeconomic event events like one thing i'll add you know in the last year since the ftx um debacle you know we bought over 3.3 exahash machines at about 26 joules a terahash an average of 1350 a terahash so we really capitalize on that bear market to get sub 30 uh efficiency machines to prepare for the halving and so we've been upgrading our fleet uh, with our most recent purchase, our fleet is going to be at 29 joules a terahash average. And that's impressive because we're a legacy miner. We've been running since 2017. So we've had to upgrade machines. And every time we buy machines, we, we do so not just for the headline, but we do it to make sure that we actually ROI. The J-Pros we bought last December, Spencer, are already 100% paid off, right? Mm. So we've got six months ahead of us to get into, well, four to five months to get into the halving. So... Um, we always buy machines for optimal uh, cash flow return on invested capital. And that's why we do smaller orders all the time instead of just like, oh, we just ordered 80,000 machines or whatever, you know? Hmm, interesting. I mean, to me, I would have thought that you'd get like an economy of scale with per 
making a larger order. Um, so you, do you think that like making these smaller purchases and, and smaller tranches is allowing you guys to to get better pricing uh, overall? Yeah, of course. I mentioned I'm not trying to you know toot my team's horn, but we we're, we've developed mastery of hash rate economics. And really, what it comes down to is not how many machines you buy; it's what dollar per tera hash are you getting it for. And you know, it's it's uh, it's really just that. And the other thing too is if you have machine orders that are for like far out delivery, uh, your capital's not performing if you have to put a lot of money up front. And so we've been sniping these orders mm-hmm. of anywhere from one to five thousand machines because they're all for immediate delivery, right? Okay. And yeah. that, that that allows you to uh, like you, you can't buy eighty thousand machines and have them ship tomorrow. Where do you even plug them in, right? So we buy machine we buy machine purchases in quantities that we can immediately plug in. And we're always looking at what are the existing machines we have, what are they earning, and what is the what is the increase when they get swapped out. Ideally we ex- we always want to expand first before we upgrade, but we've been very strategic, you know. 18 months before the halving, like, you know, November of 2022. And we started um, very strategically sniping these orders. And I don't think we get credit for that uh, because it's a lot of small headlines that you have to pay attention to instead of one big sexy headline, right? Mm -hmm. But these forums, when we talk to enthusiasts like you that are very keen on the industry and you understand these essential things, I know a lot of your readers are, some of them are likely miners and they follow the industry closely. You know, I would invite them go back and, and you know pay attention to when we were um, making these purchases, right? It, you you expand in the bear markets, right? Buy when there's blood in the streets. Well, I remain um, just what I was sharing with you is is that when we've made big purchases, we've been nothing but delays and disappointments. So you you say, okay, I'm going to buy this this S19 Pro. And, and if it was plugged in today at this cost of energy, it'll take me uh, 225 days to get my money back. Um, and But by the time it gets there, it's now 360 days. They, mm. So when you do these big orders, they get lots of press and lots of stuff. And, and, and investors seem to speculators uh, like that. That's a, I must admit that. That's what it, the reality. But the reality is they don't get plugged in. Um, and, and we know before the last crisis, there was a, one one of the big miners had something like 60,000 machines sitting on the floor. Uh, mm-hmm. By the time they delivered, um, the buildings weren't ready. Then you had a bankruptcy and you had all this all this turmoil around you. We're very conservative. OK, you got 10 megawatts. Right? We just bought uh, six. OK, let's get the machines and plug them in uh, and, and, and manage that we have this. The, a high cash flow return on invested capital, but we're very proud that we have only 20 employees. Uh, when you take a look at our revenue per employee, we're the highest. Uh, we have the lowest GNA uh, per Bitcoin mined. Uh, we're, we're that's just a, a fact, and, uh, and and we're very proud that that's how we run a very efficient machine operation. Um, Regular Anthony Powers does his, his uh, presentation, and he'll show us being number one, number two, number one. But I think the most number ones for efficiency, which Iden has done a phenomenal job at, has been Hive. So we're very efficient when it comes to mining uh, Bitcoin. You look at the bigger ones, you'll see that their efficiency is substantially lower. You'll see that if they didn't get back the money from the grid, they actually would be losing a lot of money. So they are into selling shares uh, to keep the keep the the treadmill going, and we just have a different business model. That much more like a, I would say, a Franco Nevada gold royalty model. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I think. Uh, I mean, as the Bitcoin mining sector generally in the equities markets has been on fire the last like month and a half or so, um, I think people are really starting to try to bear down and be like, okay, what is what's really behind each of these balance sheets here. I mean, I think you've made an interesting case for what differentiates Hive from other Bitcoin mining firms. Um, and especially is is that management philosophy. I think the discussion of high performance compute um, in the context of data center management is something that you, uh, at least I haven't heard any other publicly traded miners discuss. Um, so all, all that considered, I think it's been really fascinating uh, for everyone to, to think about how the sector is going to evolve um, and what the competing philosophies are. Um, but I think, you know, I, I've kept you guys uh, long enough. I'm sure you've got to get back to hashing. But 
Um, I would just ask if you guys have any, uh, you know, parting remarks for our audience, anything they can expect from Hive uh, or anything you're just particularly excited about in the Bitcoin space. Look up. That's why Bitcoin's going. Look up. <laughs> yeah, I would just add, um, you know, the whole HPC is, is a lot easier said than done. I think there's companies rushing into the space that have zero uh, history running GPUs, let alone doing it at a high performance computing level. So, uh, you know, we are cash flowing, we're expanding, it's super exciting. And I think just stay tuned because uh, as Frank mentioned, you know, we're, we're headed down to Silicon Valley again tomorrow. It's our second time in a month. Um, and uh, we're really engaged with the community. We did a GPU contest uh, where we give away some compute time. Uh, so we found some phenomenal uh, uh, researchers and startups that are doing some super cool stuff. So we're going to be uh, hoping to allow the research community to do some disruptive things with um, uh, LLMs on our infrastructure. And uh, as Frank said, you know, look up or, or look at our press releases. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, Iden and Frank, thank you so much for joining us on the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. This was a fascinating conversation um, and we covered quite a lot of ground. So I really appreciate uh, both of you taking the time. Um, I look forward to chatting with you both again soon. Um, but in the meantime, happy holidays and uh, best of luck out there. Thank, thank you, Spencer. We'll, we'll, we'll see you in questions. Nashville. Fantastic. Yeah, look, looking forward to Nashville. That's going to be a great time. Um, Bitcoin 2024. Uh, come say hey. Thanks. Cheers. Take care. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we can uh, we can let the interview. You know, it's still recording, but I'll I'll pause it momentarily. But uh, yeah, Frank, that, that was awesome, man. That was super fun. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, you had great questions. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to do that every time I get on the mic. So I'm um, trying to live up to CK's name. So we'll see how that goes. Good. Well, thank you. Take care. Have a wonderful holidays. Bye. Likewise. That management of the, the merge and what you're doing with the, uh, the wow. Okay. Jeez, you guys have some crazy <laughs> swag over here. This is uh, this is wild.